Right, we're uh, we're doing some different messages over Advent. Next Sunday, uh, Chris, you're bringing us the word next Sunday, right? So I can take off and just, uh, uh, I will be here, I will be here. Uh, but I look for, we look forward to that. Uh, today, uh, simply, uh, here's the title of, of this morning's message. Say that, Jehovah Jireh. Say that, right? Say that again. Now, some of you may know what that means. I want you to pay attention to the message, and you tell me what it means a little later, all right? Uh, it'll be obvious, right? But as we, we do this uh, in Advent, which is a season of, of preparation, the go-to verse that we use is from John the Baptist. It's in, in Matthew chapter 3, verse 3, where he says this, This is he who was spoken of through the prophet Isaiah. A voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths for him. And and from that, he's actually quoting the prophet Isaiah, which Isaiah wrote that 700 years before the birth of Christ. But that's who he's quoting. You know, there are over 300 prophecies about the coming of the Messiah in the Old Testament, which Jesus fulfilled. From his birth, to his death, to his purpose, to his offering eternal life, over 300 that Jesus fulfilled. You see, there is a clear picture of what God is going to do throughout the entire Bible. From the very first book of Genesis, to the very last, and that's in the Old Testament, to the very last book of the New Testament, the book of Revelation, right? There is this picture of God's plan for you and for all of humanity. So today I want to look at one of the most obvious moments when God revealed his master plan for us. It's it's a really ancient story. It took place, it takes place 4,000 years ago. 4,000 years ago, isn't that crazy? Um, It took place in 2000 BC. It's the story of Abraham and his son Isaac. And we find it in the first book of the Bible, the book of Genesis. You should read Genesis. It has got some great and crazy stories in it. It's it's a wonderful book, the first book of the Old Testament. But it it begins, Genesis begins with the creation of the world and the story of Adam and Eve and their decision to sin, which separated them from God. See, they had this great relationship with God, and they were with him and walked with him like every day, it said. And, and, and God said, here, I'm, everything is, is yours to take care of here. Just don't do this one thing. This one thing. Don't eat from the fruit of this one tree. Enjoy life here. I've given you everything you need. Enjoy life. Just don't do the thing. And they said, we're going to do the thing. (laughs) And they did the thing. And all of a sudden, there was this separation between them and God because of sin and the consequences. The consequences of that choice continue right up through today, doesn't it? Now, about 12 chapters into the book of Genesis, uh, we, we read the story about Abram, whom God later changes his name to Abraham. And and it's this unbelievably important story because it is through Abraham that God restored and restarted his relationship with humanity in in like an official capacity. So in Genesis chapter 12, God shows up to Abraham and he makes him this promise. It's a covenant that he has with Abraham. And he says to him, I'm going to make you into a great nation, and I'm going to bless you. And I'm going to make your great name great, and you will actually be a blessing to the entire world. Now, Abraham is really thrilled to hear this promise because he and his wife, Sarah, were not able to have children. They, 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 never, they didn't have any children between them on their own. And so this is like, we're thrilled because God is going to 
make that happen. He has to make that happen if I'm going to be the father of a great nation, right? And, and, and they just longed for a child all their life. And, and, and their life has gone on for a long time at this point. Abraham and his wife are well beyond childbearing years when this happened. I don't want to use the term old, you know. I mean, you know, it, it can be offensive a little bit, you know. But these guys, they, Abraham and Sarah, they are advanced in years, okay. When they heard, when they heard that God was going to give them a son, his, his wife, Sarah, is like... Um, Look, I don't think you understand how biology works, God. <laughs> you know? Very sorry, that's not going to happen. You know? She laughed, actually, is what it says. You know? But it did happen. It did happen, and it's just an amazing miracle. And, and, and it's, it's this, this, in this dream that, they have that God uses. He uses Abraham to create a relationship with humanity. So time goes by, a lot of things happen, and, and, and God stays in relationship with Abraham all along the way, and now when Abraham, get this, is 100 years old, and Sarah is 90, she's 90 years old, she gives birth to a son, and they name their son Isaac, okay? It's Sarah's firstborn child at 90. So be careful what you ask for. <laughs> it's an amazing story. And, and Isaac, Isaac is the culmination of this promise that God had made uh, to Abraham, that he's, he's going to make uh, from him a nation. And, and Isaac would have a son whose name was Jacob. And you know that God changed Jacob's name to Israel. Think about how long ago we got that name, Israel. And Israel would have 12 sons. Each would be the father of the 12 tribes of Israel. And one of those sons would be Judah, whose tribe brings us King David, and, and, and it would also, out of that, bring us eventually Jesus, called the Lion of Judah. So we're seeing here the birth the birth of the people group that would lead us to Jesus. And it brings us all the way to where we are today. But at one point, it almost ended. Right there in Genesis 2000 BC with Isaac. The story is in Genesis chapter 22. So I'm going to read this. The words, uh, the scriptures will be up on the screen. And, and, and it, talks, it talks about... This, this story shows us how it leads to the Christmas story, okay? I just wanted you to keep remembering that. It shows us what God had in mind all along, right? and he begins revealing his story way back 2,000 years earlier in Genesis chapter 22. So here's uh, verse 1. Sometime later, God tested Abraham, and he said to he said to him, Abraham, here I am, he replied. God said, take your son, your only son, whom you love, Isaac, and go to the region of Moriah, sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on the mountain I will show you. Wow. All right, let's just stop there for a moment. Because if you're new to church and, and you're new to the Bible, and I just talked about child sacrifice at 11 a.m. on Sunday morning, uh, let me take a second to explain. God is not a proponent of child sacrifice, okay? Uh, there, there, there's, it's not something he often talks about in the Bible. This, this is the only story about it. So, I, 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 so that you're not stressed for the next few minutes, Abraham is not going to kill Isaac, Okay. Uh, I, I just feel like you need to know that. Uh, in, in fact, God even writes into the law, the laws, because remember, this is 4,000 years ago, right? The world is a very different place than it is today. And so they actually had to have a law. God made sure they had a law for his people not to sacrifice their children because all of the, the nations around them would sacrifice to a God named Moloch. It was a common practice to have a lot of kids 
and there was this, the, to sacrifice one of them to this pagan god called Moloch in order to preserve your other children. You know, and because they believed that Moloch would protect your other children if you, I don't know, picked your least favorite, I guess. I don't know how that worked. Um, and, 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 uh, and, and that was that. And so this story is not that story, right? Instead, this is a story about God revealing what he was willing to do for, for you, but would never ask you to do for him. It's a different kind of story. In fact, the language, just think about the language that he begins to use, actually mirrors the same language that we see in the Gospels when we talk about Jesus. Right? So, so Abra, God said to Abraham, take your son, your only son. Right? One of the ways that some of the scriptures translate there, take your son, your only begotten son. Does that sound familiar? John 3.16, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, exact same language, that whoever believes in him would not perish but have eternal life. Now Abraham and Sarah only had together this one son. And God asks him to prove his love for him by sacrificing him. Now, this is a nuance in the story that, uh, that I think it's important for us to understand because uh, it's, it's not like an obvious thing. God was asking Abraham to sacrifice Isaac in place of his own sins. Because that's what sacrifices were all about. They're, the penalty of sin was death. And so when he calls it a burnt offering, that tells us that he is asking Abraham to lay Isaac on an altar to become an atoning sacrifice. In the book of Genesis, in the beginning, when sin enters the world, you know, when, when, when God says, don't eat from that one tree, and if you do, the punishment is death, and they do it anyways. Death is now a part of the punishment, something they all have to deal with, and we all have to still deal with uh, because of the decision that got made back then. So there was this system created early on, even with Cain and Abel, the son's of Adam and Eve, you know, that you would sacrifice as a, as a burnt offering uh, your, your firstborn lamb, right, to satisfy the punishment. But it was temporary. You had to go through this many, many times in your life because after that one, you, we kept sinning, you see. And, and in order to remain in this relationship with God, so, so Abraham is being called to take his son Isaac, place him on an altar, as a burnt offering, as an atoning sacrifice for her sins. All right, verse 3. Early the next morning, Abraham got up and loaded his donkey. He took with him two of his servants and his son Isaac. When he had cut enough wood for the burnt offering, he set out for the place God had told him about. On the third day, Abraham looked up and saw the place in the distance. Which day? Man, the connections to the gospel are woven throughout all of this story. Right? He said to his servants, stay here with the donkey while I and the boy go over there. We will worship and then we'll come back to you. And Abraham took the wood for the burnt offering and placed it on his son Isaac. And he himself carried the fire and the knife. As the two of them went on together, Isaac spoke up and said to his father, Abraham, Father, yes, my son. Now, this is, a, again, a 4,000-year-old story, and I know it's hard for us today to, to try to put ourselves in it. But I want you to just imagine with me for a second the weight of those three words, yes, my son. The gravity, the realization the understanding, the anxiety, the pain. Father, the fire and the wood are here, said Isaac, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Dad? Yes, son. We got everything except one thing. What are we sacrificing today? 
Abraham answered, God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. And the two of them went on together. Now, Abraham, I don't think, is lying to his son here. I think he had faith and he had hope. I, he, he knew God was a good God. He had proven himself to Abraham to be good. And so there was a lot of hope in those words. In fact, you know the New Testament tells us that Abraham thought, even if I do kill Isaac, God has the power to resurrect him. See the faith? That's why he's in the Hall of Faith. You know, uh, Abraham is in Hebrews. Uh, when they reached the place God had told them about, Abraham built an altar there and arranged the wood on it, and he bound his son Isaac and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Then he reached out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. But the angel of the Lord called out to him from heaven, Abraham, Abraham, here I am, he replied. Do not lay a hand on the boy. Do not do anything to him. Now I know that you fear God because you have not withheld from me your son, your only son. Which is interesting because guess what? They would have not have had children if God did not give them a son. It's really God's son in many ways, right? When we, when we talk about that. Abraham looked up, and there in the thicket he saw a ram caught by its thorns. He went over and took the ram and sacrificed it as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called that place, the Lord will provide. And in the Hebrew, that means Jehovah Jireh. So turn to somebody and say, Jehovah Jireh, God will provide. And to this day, it, said, it is said, on the mountain of the Lord, it will be provided. Don't you know that God is the God that provides for us? All right, to break this all down a little bit, Abraham is the father of the Jewish nation, the Jewish faith, and ultimately our faith as well, right? And he's the first man to enter into a relationship with God since Adam, a real one. Since Adam, God asks him to sacrifice his one and only son as an atonement for sin, his sin, to prove his love for God, and he's going to go through with it. But at the last minute, an angel stops him and says, you've shown your love for God, so now go get that ram in the thicket, in the bushes, and you can sacrifice it instead to atone for your sin in Isaac's. 2,000 years before Jesus would be born on Christmas Day. Do you know that that's just as much time, by the way, give perspective here, from Abraham to Jesus as it is from Jesus to us today. Right? That, you, gotta, cause I, you know, I don't know about you, but, but sometimes I think, man, Jesus, that's a long, long time ago. 2,000 years, seems, you know. I mean, they were asking the question shortly after Jesus went, how long is this going to take? And now we're here we are. Two that story that I just talked about with Abraham was the same distance between that time and Jesus' day as it is from Jesus' day to us. Right? This is not outside of God's timing. And God is showing us in that story what he's willing to do for us and why. A father willing to sacrifice his son, not for his sins, but for the sins of the world. A God who doesn't ask us to sacrifice ourselves or somebody that we love. A God who provides a ram in the bushes. A sacrifice for us that costs us absolutely nothing. 2,000 years before the first Christmas, God is revealing his plan to humanity. Isn't that incredible? It was always there. It was there from the very beginning. He knew the path that would lead us to where we are today. In John, the Gospel of John now, this is John the Baptist, Behold the Lamb of God who has come to take away the sins of the world. The Lamb of God and the Ram in the shrubs. The miracle of Christmas is revealed throughout the entire Bible. 
The good news of Jesus Christ is declared from Genesis to Revelation. And all the way through, there is this one consistent thread, one consistent story about how we have a creator and a father who loves us so deeply and, and, and so dearly that, well, there is nothing he would not do in order to have a relationship with you. And he loves you so much that the moment the relationship is broken, he had a plan for it to be restored. And he tells us, I'm going to show you what I'm willing to do for you to show you how much I love you. So here's the takeaways from this story of Abraham and Isaac. First off, it's what I just said. I, I want us to see in, in this story that God always had a plan. He's always had a plan. The ancient story that we read this morning is, is so clearly describing the sacrifice and the substitution of Jesus. I mean, it is some of the clearest evidence that we can see in Scripture that God has always had a plan, right? Um, he had a plan for Abraham. Abraham had no idea, by the way, right? He's terrified. God had a plan. He had a plan in place. In the story, God reveals that he has a plan for atonement. He has a plan for peace. And he has a plan uh, of his sacrifice 2,000 years before it happened. Abraham, think about this. Abraham did not in his lifetime get to find out what all of that really meant that he went through. Right? And neither did millions of other people for thousands of years until Christmas morning happened. But God had a plan the entire time. You know, we get it because we're, you know, we're way on the other side of it. So we can look back and compare, the, you know, uh, uh, and, and, and so we see what God himself would do. But none of the people in the Genesis story did. Imagine if the, if the servants would like, oh, should we do something? You know, um, should we say something? Uh, it seems like he's going to kill Isaac here. And uh, they didn't know. They would never know. And you see a lot of times, right? We go through our lives and we're wondering, is God even aware with what we're dealing with? Where we're going, what's happening? And we forget that God's got the whole book already. We only get to see a couple of lines. God has a plan. He's had a plan from the very beginning. And that plan ultimately includes you and me in the story. God had a plan thousands of years in advance and it's unfolding even right now today in this sanctuary or wherever you are as you're, as you're joining us for this service. And that he would continue to work on that plan until Jesus comes back. God has had a plan a long time before you and I showed up on the scene. And it's not finished yet. And maybe, maybe this Christmas, maybe, maybe, well, maybe what you really need this Christmas is to be reminded that you are not some random accident, that your future, your future is not some random path on who knows where, but that you have the opportunity to step into the plan and the purpose that God has had for you from the beginning of creation. There's a lot, there's a lot of things in this life, right, that, that we can blame on God that probably have nothing to do with him. And we say, well, it's God's plan, and well, maybe it was just a bad decision, okay? I don't, you know, I don't really think God has mapped out what you're having for lunch today. So you, you know what, that, you're going to have to decide that on your own. I don't, I, really, I don't think for the most part it works that way. I don't think that's what Scripture teaches. It's not like that, but he tells us, he still tells us he has a plan. And sometimes things happen 
not because they're a part of God's plan, but because we live in a fallen world, right? And bad things happen. But rather, God has a goal in mind for you. A purpose in mind for you. He has a purpose for every single person in humanity here. Just as he had a plan in mind for Abraham. He's designed you exactly the way he wanted you. He's designed you exactly the way that he needs in order for him to make that goal of reality in your life. God's created you with specific gifts, passions, desires, longings, ways he wants you to grow the kingdom and reveal what Jesus has done for us on the cross. The story of Jesus to the world, and he's made you a part of that story. That's his plan. That's his purpose for you, and it's tailored to you, but it's the same plan for everybody. Right, and, and, and one of our goals here at Norwood is to help you discover your place in that plan, the place in that purpose. We want you to, to help discover that. That's why if you go to myambc.life, there's a car there that just says Discipleship Pathway, and, and that's a part of helping us and giving you resources to figure that out. It's why we have a class that we want any, anybody new here to go through called Next Moves, where you'll learn about what that story of the cross really means, and you'll, you'll understand better how that plays out here at Norwood. But you leave there asking the question and getting help with, so what's my next move? What's my next step in the plan? And that journey could actually start with a simple question. I'm going to take this question out of the story of Abraham, right? What has God called you to that doesn't make a lot of sense? Is there something? Doesn't make sense to you. Doesn't make sense to our world. Abraham was given a promise that involved God multiplying his descendants, and then God calls him to sacrifice his son. Makes no sense whatsoever, right? But it's because God had a larger one, right? He had a a larger lesson that he was teaching and a bigger statement he was making. He calls people to do things that don't make any sense to us. God calls Mary right, to carry this child and raise him. And she would one day have to watch him be sacrificed. God called Joseph to be his earthly father and trust all these odd things like a virgin birth that was part of God's plan. The Christmas story from start to finish is filled with people being led to do things that didn't make any sense to them, but that would ultimately change the world. So there's my question. I wonder what God is leading you to do today that would change the world around you. And maybe it's time, like Abraham, that we just trust him. Proverbs 3.5 says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding because you may not understand where God is taking you, what he's doing, what he has called you to do, what he's called you, what, what sacrifice he has called you to make, the changes in your life he's calling you to, the risks that he actually wants you to take on behalf of his kingdom, the places he wants you to, to step into and serve, the dreams that he's unveiling before you. You may never understand it, But in all your ways, submit to him, and he will make the path straight. God is the bringer of purpose. He's always had a plan, and you've always been a part of it. And his ultimate plan is pretty simple. He wants you to be in relationship with him, to know him more and more, and then to lead other people to be in relationship with him and help them to know him more and more and more, And that's always been the plan. Everything points to it. So I wonder if you're here today or or joining us online and, and you don't have a relationship with Jesus. 
Maybe you're living right now with anxiety and unrest and there's a storm just going on inside of you and you're wondering, what is the point of all this? Right? What is, what is the purpose in my life? And I want you to know that there is one who had you in mind since you were formed in your mother's womb even before. And he's willing to sacrifice his son on your behalf. And he's not asking you to do anything other than right now reach out and accept his outstretched hand. Accept the gift of Jesus, the sacrifice that he's already laid out for you and enter into a relationship with him. God cares so deeply about his relationship with you that he began writing that story at the very beginning. Thousands of years ago, God was writing the story of how he would have a relationship with you. So if you're ready to begin that relationship today, um, let's just bow our heads for a moment. Eyes closed, our heads. If you want to start that, just start with a prayer. You start by simply saying yes and thank you. And, 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 and just pray something like this. Heavenly Father, forgive me of my sins. Forgive me to tr for trying to do it on my own. And I see that you had a plan for me and I need you and I believe in you and I believe in the sacrifice you made for me. And so all that I am from this day on, I am yours. In Jesus' name, amen. If you have any questions about that, I would invite you just to please, you know, just ask. Talk, talk to someone. We're, we're happy to talk to you about what all of that means.